Hello. This video is meant for revision. And I'll be going through a few questions on electricity and magnetism. And the first question says, a body is said to be negatively charged if, so we have four options, A, if it is deficient of electrons, if it contains only electrons, if it contains more electrons than protons, and if it is deficient of neutrons. So let's quickly remind ourselves, electrons, let me get a pen, electrons are negatively charged. They carry negative charges. Protons carry positive charges. Neutrons are neutral. So when we say that a body is positively charged, it is reasonable to think that it is containing more positive charges than negative charges. When we say a body is negatively charged, that means it is containing more negative charges than positive charges. And when we say a body is neutral, then it is containing equal number of positive and negative charges. So this is neutral. This is negative. And this is positive. Good. So when we say that the number of positive charges is greater than the number of negative charges, it is easy to say that, yes, the number of protons is more than the number of electrons. And when we say the number of negative charges is greater than the number of positive charges, it is to say that the number of electrons is more than the number of protons. Knowing that the magnitude of the charge of an electron is equal to the magnitude of the charge of a proton, it's just that the nature is what we have as opposites. And it is unrealistic for us to say that a body is containing just protons or a body is containing just electrons so when we are not talking about the hydrogen ion. So uh, for we to say that a body is negatively charged, Let's consider the options one after the other. For we to say that the body is negatively charged, is it deficient of electrons? The answer is certainly no. When a body is deficient of electrons, such bodies are said to be positively charged and not negatively charged. Yes, we cross out option A. It can't be option A because that negates what we are, what is requested of us. So let's look at the next option. If it contains only electrons, when a body contains only electrons, that is unrealistic for we to think about a body, a physical body containing only electrons. So that's of the market. Then option C says it contains more electrons than protons. When a body contains more electrons than protons, then it has a net negative charge. And uh, this looks reasonable, it's acceptable. Yes, it's for us to define a body that has more electrons than protons or that has more negative charges than positive charges to be regarded as negative charged body. And finally, it is deficient of neutrons. Excess or deficiency of neutrons makes no effect on the net charge of an atom or of a body because neutrons have no charge.
neutrons are neutral. So a body cannot be said to be negatively charged because of excess or deficiency of electrons. So option C makes it. Let's move on to another question. Coulomb's law states that the electrostatic force between two charges is inversely proportional to. I think before looking at the options, let's quickly define Coulomb's law in mathematical notation. So Coulomb's law says that the electrostatic force F is directly proportional to the product of two charges Q1 and Q2 and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating Q1 and Q2. This expression can be broken down into two by saying that the electrostatic force F is directly proportional to the product of charges Q1 and Q2. We can also say that electrostatic force F is inversely proportional to the square of the distance that separates charges Q1 and Q2. So now let's look at the options. Option A says the distance between the charges is not now. So it's trying to say that the Coulomb's law is stating that the force, electrostatic force between two charges is inversely proportional to the distance between the charges. No, that is wrong. It is not distance, but square of distance. So A, get out. Now, inversely proportional to the product of the charges. Inversely proportional to the product of charges. No, we know it as directly proportional and not inversely proportional. So B, get out. And C, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the charges. Yes, this excellent, acceptable. That agrees with what we have written in there. And option D says the square root of the product of the charges. Square root of the products of the charges. That is wrong, unacceptable. So option C takes it again. Let's move forward. Here is another question that says that which of the following statements is or are true about electric fields? And what are the statements? Statement one says that they are caused by the motion of charged particles. Mm, motion of charged particles, no way. When electric charges are in motion, we know that magnetic fields is set up around them in addition to the electric field. When electric charges are either stationary or in motion, they manifest their electric fields. Yes, we cannot say that the electric fields are caused by their motion. Since even when they are not in motion, they still have electric fields. So statement one is invalid. Then let's look at statement two, which is that they always point in direction of decreasing potential. Decreasing potential. They point in direction. Well, let's think about a positive charge. The lines of force directing radially outwards. Since the lines of force are directed radially outwards, what it implies is that when we put a test positive charge at any point here, it will move in the direction of the arrows. And when that happens, we say that that charge is moving or uh, the potential of that, uh, you say that that test charge is moving in direction of decreasing potential. Hence, so we can say that option uh, statement two is reasonable and acceptable. So now let's move to the third, which is that they are always perpendicular to the direction of motion of charged particles. That is, electric fields are always perpendicular 
to the direction of motion of charged particles. This makes no sense. Being seen is uh, always perpendicular to the direction of motion. No. When it's uh, like uh, the diagram we have here, a charged particle will have electric field around it. And when it's in motion, let's say it's moving in the direction of this line to the left, the you know, that will not make that line to bend elsewhere. So we will not say that that line is perpendicular to the uh, motion of the charge. So option statement three is invalid. So statement two is the only correct statement amongst one, two, and three. Let's move forward. Which of the following statements is or are correct about electric potential? Statement one says it's a vector quantity. Two says it's always positive. And three says it's measured the votes. So let's look at this one after the other. Is electric potential a scalar or a vector quantity? That's uh, one of the elementary introduction to electric potential, which is it's a scalar quantity. Electric potential is not concerned with the direction. Uh, so it's a scalar. So we don't describe electric potential by using uh, vector notation, actually. So then, uh, the second statement says it is always positive. Mm. I think it's good we define electric potential to say it as electric potential. Sorry. SFI is equal to a constant K charge Q divided by half. So Q, which is, uh, which is charge, may be either positive or negative. And when it's positive, it, uh, so, so when it's positive, then uh, the potential will be positive, and when Q is negative, the potential will be negative. So we can say that of statement two, or uh, statement two does not really make sense. So we have to cross statement two out. And then uh, finally, statement three it is measured in volts. Yes, it is measured in volts. That's one of the basics of electric potential. It is measured in volts. So that means that statement three is the only valid statement uh, in this uh, amongst this string. So let's move forward a bit. Mm. Okay, what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor? with a separation of one centimeter and areas of 0.1 meter square and a dielectric constant of two. I will say, so, so I think it's could bring out the important points here. Distance of separation D is equal to one centimeter. That's equal to 0 0.01 meter. Area is 0 0.1 meter square. And dielectric constant, dielectric constant is relative permittivity. 
That's two. So we know that the capacitance is directly proportional to the area of the plates and inverse proportional to the distance of separation between the plates. And the uh, capacitance is equal to epsilon, which is the constant of proportionality, A over D. And epsilon is equal to epsilon R, the relative permittivity or dielectric constant, times epsilon naught, which is the permittivity of free space, A over D. So from the information, epsilon R, dielectric constant is two, epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the power minus 12, per meter times a the area 0 0.1 meter divided by d which is 0 0.01 meter and uh, when we simplify this we have a capacitance to be equal to 1.77 times 10 raised to the power minus 10 parent. Let's move forward again. Two coins lined 1.5 meter apart on the table. They carry identical charges. How large is the charge on each? If a coin experiences an electric force, of two newtons. So electric force F is equal to constant of proportionality Q1, Q2, over distance of separation R squared. And in this information, we have been told that the force is two. Force of attraction is two newtons. And Q1 and Q2 are identical. That is Q1 is equal to Q2. Sorry, I missed out one, yeah? So, and the distance of separation R is equal to 1.5 meter. And now we want to know what is the values of Q1 or Q2. So easily we can, we write this expression to be F is equal to K, since Q1 is equal to Q2, I say Q1 squared all over R squared. And that is now we saying that in place of F, we put two new things in place of K, the constant here is nine times 10 raised to the power nine times Q1 squared, that is what we, it does to the unknown, divided by R squared, that is 1.5 squared. So the units on both sides should be newtons. So when we simplify or call it whatever name you like, you have Q1 squared to be equal to two times 1.5 squared divided by nine times 10 is for nine. So when you simplify this, you should get and I'll, and I'll find the square root of both sides so that you have Q1, you should have your Q1 to be, sorry, you should have your Q1 to be equal to 2.24, times 10 raised to the power minus five. Cool. So we'll stop here for now. And in the next video, I'll be uh, revising some questions that have to do with electric circuits.
See you later. Bye.